I assume that probably most people in the audience have a, a technical background, but you might not all be familiar with UV technology. And there, there is some terminology that is important to sort of have an understanding of before we go into the more specific uh, technical talk later on. So I'm a bit like if you go to a rock concert and there's a band that comes on before the main event. I, I'm sort of the band that's, that's getting you warmed up before the main event uh, comes on in a few minutes. So first of all, UV. Uh, where does that fall on the electromagnetic spectrum? You can see it there on the top part of that slide. Uh, typically, we're talking about wavelengths in sort of the uh, well, sort of 150 up to 350 nanometer range, roughly. Um, and you probably hear the term uh, germicidal used a few times uh, today. So germicidal means wavelengths that are able to kill germs, as, as the word uh, suggests. And it's quite important that you are clear about what wavelengths you're talking about when you're talking about UV disinfection, because different wavelengths will have different effects um, on organisms uh, and also on other chemicals that might be present in the water. Uh, and so, you know, if you're using, if, if we say UV, we have to be clear really about what type of UV we're, we're talking about. And if you have a lamp that emits UVA radiation, that's typically not going to be as effective at inactivating germs as uh, something that emits UVC, which is more in the, the germicidal range. And quite often, we've already heard the term used a few times today, uh, we talk about inactivation of microbes by UV light instead of killing. Uh, and there's a sort of subtle but important difference between the two. So inactivation means that the organism is changed in some way, which means it can't reproduce anymore. It can't form copies of itself. And a public health or microbiologist public health a person will tell you that really that's pretty well as good as killing the organism because it means once the organism gets in your gut, it can't form copies of, each other, of itself and spread throughout your body and, and cause infection. So in order for organisms to be inactivated, the energy that you're supplying by the UV somehow uh, has to be absorbed. And uh, it just so happens that DNA and RNA, which are the important sort of master instructions of all biological cells, they absorb pretty heavily in the, the UVC range. So the idea behind UV disinfection really is if we can damage these, these key nucleic acids within cells, DNA or the RNA, then even if the organism isn't dead, it's not really a able to replicate itself anymore because it has this damage in its, in its uh, key master instructions. Okay, and some of you may also be familiar with uh, the use of chemical disinfectants. And there, when you're applying something like chlorine, you have to think about both the concentration of chlorine that you're adding and also the contact time of the chlorine with the, with the water. And a similar principle applies with UV uh, technology, except the challenge here is that you can't easily just take a water sample and measure how much UV is in the water because you haven't added a chemical to the water. Um, so. We talk about uh, UV dose as being the product of the intensity of light that you've applied to the water, but also the amount of time that the water's been exposed to the light. And that's sort of the terminology that civil engineers like me quite often use. If you talk to a photochemist, uh, they would probably prefer to use the term fluence. So sometimes you hear fluence of UV, which is the same as dose, and fluence, not technically exactly the same, but uh, for practical purposes, <laughs> we'll call it the same today and fluence rate as being analogous to intensity of UV light. You'll also see different units for UV dose or fluence, depending on uh, well, really where the author of the document uh, came from, mostly. So uh, typically, we're talking about units of joules per, per uh, surface area. Uh, and uh, sometimes you see that as joules per square meter, millijoules per square centimeter. Sometimes you see it broken down into the units of intensity and time, so watts, seconds per uh, unit area. Uh, and the key thing just to remember is if you're looking at different papers and maybe comparing them or, or different documents, that 10 joules per square meter is not the same as 10 millijoules per square centimeter. There's a factor of 10 adjustment difference there. So uh, a commonly a, a targeted dose in a lot of regulations uh, in, in Europe, for example, is that you should always try to achieve a minimum of 40 millijoules per centimeter squared. So that's the same as 400 joules per uh, square meter. Okay, just something to keep in mind in case we get confused about orders of magnitude later on when we're seeing the talk. Um, 
Um, you probably all know what login activation means too, but just for those who haven't uh, seen that uh, microbial inactivation expressed in that way before, it's essentially the number of nines in the percent reduction of the of the organism. So if you get 90% reduction of the organism, that's one log. 99% is two log. 99.9% three log, etc. Et and we saw a slide uh, uh, in the last talk with uh, slightly different uh, data points than the ones I'm showing here, I think, but the general same same sort of trend of relationship between UV dose and sensitivity of different organisms to the UV. Uh, and so you can see that on the, the left-hand side there, we have uh, Cryptosporidium and Giardia, which are sort of larger uh, protozoan uh, parasites. And uh, before about 1998, 1999, people thought actually that those were over on the right side of this uh, graph, that they were actually quite resistant to UV. Um, but we sort of changed the way we looked at the inactivation of Cryptosporidium and found that actually it is fairly sensitive. Then we have uh, bacteria. And then we have on the right side there, you can see we have viruses on the right side there. So for UV at least, it's, it's, as we heard earlier today, it's sort of the opposite of chlorine in that where, whereas chlorine has a problem with cryptosporidium, crypto is pretty well uh, uh, immune to chlorine, uh, it can handle viruses pretty easily and with UV it's almost the opposite uh, relationship. So that's what I'm sort of showing on this slide. And so, again, if you had uh, a multi-barrier disinfection strategy, as we tend to have in sort of uh, centralized drinking water treatment plants, for example, uh, both of these disinfectants will give you a little bit of, will give you some inactivation of all of these groups of organisms, but it's important to recognize that neither disinfectant will give you complete coverage against every possible pathogen that you might find in the water. And uh, just to echo the comment that was made earlier, that you see a lot of studies in developing countries of, of technologies for developing countries which look at just E. coli, for example, uh, which is frustrating, especially if you're talking about sort of physical filtration technology where viruses are much smaller than bacteria, for example. So, um, and, and if, if rotavirus or norovirus is what's causing the illness in a community, then E. coli is not really a reliable surrogate for, for treatment. Okay, so I mentioned that UV inactivates things. It doesn't always outright kill them. Uh, and so a note about DNA repair, you might say, well, if it's not dead, how do you know it's not going to come back to life and, and reinfect the water? And there's been research into different repair mechanisms, and there are what are called light and dark repair, which means that sometimes organisms can use um, exposure to sunlight and, uh, to uh, use that energy to repair some of the damage to their DNA. And there are also uh, ways in which they can use enzymes to repair their DNA without light. Um, the typical consensus, though, I think, is that in, in drinking water treatment, it's not normally a big uh, concern, and that if you apply enough UV to water, sort of in the typical doses that we're looking to apply in drinking water treatment, you really cause too much damage to the organism for it to be able to repair that, uh, that, that DNA damage. So you might see some repair if you apply a little bit of UV and then you give it plenty of chance to recover. Uh, but typically, the good news is that uh, we, for most organisms, we can, we can not really worry about DNA repair. So where do you get UV from? It comes in big gallon drums like this. Uh, okay, I'm glad some people <laughs> are smiling and laughing. It does not come in big UV, UV drums. It comes from a variety of different sources. And this uh, graph, uh, apologies to the UV uh, manufacturers in the room, because this is a very simplified uh, diagram of how you make a UV reactor. Uh, and it's not just a lamp in a box, which you plug in. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the common features of UV reactors traditionally uh, for uh, treating water in, in centralized drinking water treatment plants is you have a, a lamp with a bit of mercury in it. Uh, which is connected to an electronic ballast, which provides a nice steady current at, at the right uh, level to spark the mercury, which is the source of the uh, UV emission from the lamp. And typically the lamp sits within a quartz sleeve, which protects the lamp from things that might be flowing along in the water, for example, um, from coming into direct contact with the lamp. 
uh, and you then have a sensor which would be uh, here pointing at the lamp as a means of monitoring the uh, performance of the lamp. Uh, and then you have some type of reactor vessel which contains the lamp. You can also have open channel reactors where the lamps are not necessarily enclosed in a in the reactor, but they're, they're open to the air uh, on one surface. So there are variations really in, uh, in how to design UV reactors, but those are some, some of the common um, features that you'll, you'll probably see in some of the talks coming up. Just a picture of what a UV lamp uh, looks like, very similar to sort of a fluorescent lamp that you might have in your, in your office, uh, just a different sort of phosphorescent uh, coating. With, uh, on the lamps that you have in your in your office, which converts the, the energy to visible light, and there are different types of, of UV lamps that you can use uh, for disinfection. And so I showed earlier that you want to have lamps that emit in the germicidal range, and it turns out that if you uh, spark mercury with a, a electrical current, if you have a little bit of mercury at, at a sort of a, a lower uh, pressure, the mercury will emit mostly in this sort of uh, 254 nanometer. Uh, peak here, so the, the blue bars here represent if you have what's called a low pressure lamp. And then if you have sort of a slightly higher pressure and slightly more mercury in the lamp, you get what's called medium pressure emission, which is more broadband uh, polychrom call it polychromatic emission. So you get lots of, lots of UV wavelength. And the important thing to note from, you might just ask, well, why doesn't everybody use medium pressure lamps? And uh, the important thing just to note there is that the y-axis scale is different for low pressure and medium pressure lamps. So Medium pressure lamps actually emit much more energy than low pressure lamps, uh, but require more, or less, uh, require more input energy to do so. And so if we uh, look at this emission of uh, UV lamps, and fortuitously uh, RNA and DNA, some of the, the, uh, the bases in those nucleic acids absorb heavily within this, this range, which is what causes the germicidal Okay, a key thing also to keep in mind is that UV is not just about sticking a unit in there and walking away and forgetting about it. So like every other drinking water treatment technology, it does require uh, ongoing uh, monitoring and maintenance. And one example of that is that lamps will age over time. So just like how you have to change light bulbs in your house occasionally, you have to change UV lamps. And their output will uh, tend to decrease uh, over time. And this is just some example data uh, of how many hours that might take to get down to a, a certain level, but you have to have a sort of a plan in place for recognizing that you, you know, at a certain stage, you are going to have to go out and, and replace the lamp. And everything I've said so far really assumes that you're using a, a, a mercury-containing uh, what we call arc discharge lamp. But of course, we're going to hear uh, today that there are other ways of, of generating UV in, in much uh, less costly uh, ways, perhaps. So, for example, you could use just the UV light that's naturally found in sunlight. Uh, and the picture on the right is a picture of uh, light emitting diodes, which are, or LEDs, which are uh, becoming uh, more and more seen on, in the market for, for point of use treatment. So the key sort of benefits of, of UV and, and the reason why it's sort of become popular as a global water treatment technology is the big one, which really sparked the interest, I think, in especially in the United States, sort of in the year, around the year 2000, was the fact that we recognized that UV could inactivate cryptosporidium very easily, which is this chlorine-resistant pathogen. Um, and so uh, that motivation, along with also the fact that it doesn't form uh, regulated disinfection byproducts, which things like trihalomethanes, which occur from uh, chlorination, those two things combined are really a very attractive, um, uh, attractive benefit for some utilities who have problems with both cryptosporidium and, and disinfection byproducts, or even just one or the other. Fairly small space requirements, so you can also fairly easily go into an existing drinking water treatment plant and put a UV reactor in various places without too much disruption. So it's not like you need to build a huge contact tank. Uh, I've seen reactors slotted in, in all kinds of uh, awkward sort of spaces in drinking water treatment plants. And also, now that there has been this competitive market and, and uh, a number of really successful players in the market, the cost of UV systems have really come down compared to other uh, alternatives that you might be considering for doing the same job, like ozone and, and membrane filtration. Uh, 
No water treatment technology, though, is a complete uh, panacea, and we might all think UV is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, but it does actually have its, some limitations. It can't do everything for you. So, um, for example, if you just, uh, you might use uh, things like ozone, for example, to remove taste and odor control, uh, taste and odor causing compounds. UV at disinfection doses doesn't tend to do very much on that side of things. Uh, similarly, it doesn't remove color. Um, chlorine also will give you other benefits, like oxidizing iron and manganese, whereas UV doesn't do that on its own. And a bit later on, we might hear a little bit about what's called advanced oxidation, which is where you combine UV with uh, some type of um, um, radical generating a chemical like peroxide, for example, which will provide some of these other benefits in terms of chemical treatment of the water. The, the two sort of key ones, though, I would say from a developing country context are probably, probably the last bullet point here, which is that there's no residual disinfecting capability. So as, as Maggie said, if you're, gonna have a UV, if you're gonna put a UV system into a community, but people are gonna go fill up their water with your UV treated, uh, your UV treated water in a bucket that's completely contaminated, uh, then you know, the UV is not providing any protection really beyond the point of treatment. Whereas something like chlorine provides a certain degree of treatment uh, in the water uh, during the storage of the water. The other thing is that uh, the design and operation of UV reactors have to take into account relevant water quality factors and should include ideally some type of dose validation and monitoring strategy. So it's, it's not really one UV system fits all and you have to think about uh, how does your system, how is it designed specifically to address the water quality of your, uh, of your case study and how are you gonna monitor that the uh, UV is actually functioning. So in terms of water quality uh, considerations, uh, I'll talk briefly just about three in particular that are especially important for UV. And the thing to note really is that when you talk quite often about chemical disinfection, you're mostly worried about what's the pH of the water and what's the temperature of the water. So seasonally, you might have to change your, how much chlorine or ozone you're adding, depending on, on uh, temperature, for example. And these things don't really have a major direct impact on UV performance because it's a, more of a physical uh, treatment instead of a chemical treatment. But the top three water quality parameters there are, are quite important. So we'll probably hear this term UVT uh, a few times in the talk today. UVT stands for UV transmittance, and it's, it's basically how much uh, UV light is able to pass through that water uh, matrix. So you could have various things in the water which absorb quite a lot of UV, like iron or natural, natural organic matter, for example. And so the typical way you measure that in the lab is you, you take a certain a cuvette of a certain size, and you measure just how much light gets through a certain size of, of cubette, one centimeter is typical. And that tells you if 95% goes through, we, we call that 95% UVT. And so I would say arguably it's the most important water quality parameter. And if you're talking about clean source waters, like uh, ideally if you have drinking water or, or water that's been pre-treated a certain amount before you put your UV step in, typically the UVT might be sort of 80 or in the 90%. Wastewater, though, you're talking much lower, so the 30 to 50% might be typical. And the other thing is to recognize is that that can vary seasonally, so you don't want to just take one UVT measurement because, uh, you know, chances are it's probably going to be different if you go back on a different day or different season. So what causes uh, UVT? It's affected by both dissolved and um, particulate matter. And so generally, if you're talking about putting UV into a centralized water treatment plant, you tend to put it in the place where uh, a lot of that dissolved in particulate matter has been removed already, so typically post-filtration in the conventional treatment work. Um, I mean, the good news is you can always design a powerful enough UV system to handle any uh, UV transmit transmitting water, although obviously the, the more absorbing the water is, the, the more energy you have to put in to overcome that transmittance. It's sort of like chlorine demand. It's, it's the chlorine demand equivalent for UV. Um, and so a very rough rule of thumb, and again, some manufacturers might, uh, might disagree with this, but basically for every 5% decrease in UVT, you get about a 50% reduction in UV dose, which then means you have to build twice as much of a UV system and it's an increased cost and operating cost. Okay, so UVT, very, very important. Uh, and this graph just shows the relationship between uh, the transmission of UV in the water versus the distance uh, of, if you had a sensor and you move that sensor away from the lamp, 
how much UV you're able to see as you move further and further from the lamp. So if it's a fairly clean water, like 97% UVT, you know, even if you get sort of 20 centimeters away from the lamp, you're still getting about 70% of your UV light getting through to that point. Whereas if it's only 71% UV transmittance, and you move 20 centimeters away from the lamp, you have no UV light left at that point because it's all been absorbed by the water before it got to that point. Okay, so UVT is very, very important. Fouling is another one. And so here we heard a bit about biofouling of distribution systems. This is talking about fouling of actually the UV system itself. Uh, and this is a nice picture that Jim Malley uh, used in one of his um, presentations from an actual system where they, they pulled the sleeve out of the the ground uh, out of the um, system that was treating groundwater, I think it was, but heavily laden with iron and manganese, and the, the sleeve was completely coated in this fouling, so no UV light was getting out of the was getting out of the system in that case. So fouling of UV systems is caused by minerals that accumulate on the quartz sleeve. Uh, it blocks the light. It will occur really in any water because almost every water has minerals in it, uh, and but we could call waters that have hardness less than about 100 milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate as slow fouling waters. Uh, iron can be a particular problem. Um, so, uh, you know, you may require some type of cleaning system for your UV system if you have iron above, say, half a milligram per liter. And again, the good news is we can always design systems which overcome fouling. So uh, a lot of UV systems in, in centralized drinking water treatment plants have uh, uh, cleaners which will go back and forth and, and clean the fouling off occasionally. Uh, but if you're talking about sort of smaller point of use systems, uh, again, you have to sort of think about uh, what type of maintenance might be required to make sure the lamps stay clean over time. And the other thing is if you have a sensor pointing at the lamp and you want that sensor to give you useful information, you have to make sure you clean the sensors too because the sensor, the sensor can also get fouled up in the same way. And then the other, the last water quality parameter that's important is turbidity. And my PhD was actually on how turbidity affects UV and activation of viruses. Specifically. And the take home message is that there isn't really a direct correlation with UV effectiveness. Um, when you get to very high turbidities, obviously there is an impact. But when you're talking about sort of turbidities around the WHO standard or, or the typical turbidities that you get in drinking water, say le less than 5 NTU, let's say, uh, you get some sort of a dual effect of turbidity because turbidity is, is the particles floating around in the water, and some of those will scatter light. And of course, scattered UV light can still disinfect. So in some ways, it might actually increase the distribution of UV within your reactor and be beneficial in some ways. But on the other hand, I think what we really worry about with turbidity is that you're gonna have organisms which are, are en enmeshed within solids that are floating around in the reactor. So the UV light can't get in to, to hit the organism because it's being blocked by the, by the turbid turbidity particles. But to say that UV should be forbidden for turbid, turbid, turbid waters implies that other disinfectants work better than turbid. So you have the same problem with chlorine or ozone or, or other types of disinfectants. So it's, it's sort of a general rule of thumb that if you have turbid water, no matter what disinfectant you're using, you should try and remove the particles before you, before you add your disinfectant. But if you're talking about, uh, you know, some, some place out in the field applying a point of use system, uh, turbid waters might be most in need of a multi-barrier disinfection, so some form of filtration before UV. And as, as Maggie mentioned, that might be, for example, just a, through a cloth or, or, or sand filter, for example. And the other thing about turbidity is that it's related back to UV transmittance. So in you can have turbidity which it will increase UVT uh, by just physically blocking the passage of light through the, through the water matrix. So that's really all I wanted to say to sort of introduce you guys to the topic and get you thinking about a few things that we'll probably hear a bit more about when we talk about the case study. So the take home messages, UV is a very effective disinfectant. It's not a panacea though, it has its limitations. Um, it handles protozoa and bacteria fairly easily, but viruses might require higher doses. So again, when you're talking about uh, going into a community and uh, implementing UV, you have to sort of think about what are the important pathogens that are causing disease in that community. It's not an install and forget technology. Don't just put your UV system there and not check up on it occasionally. Uh, water quality is very important. So um, make sure that you, the UV system that you implement has accounted for these things like uh, UV transmittance and turbidity and uh, fouling. And uh, again, UV is, is very effective as part of a multi-barrier strategy, but quite often you have to have some type of pre-treatment or post-treatment even in terms of maybe adding chlorine after the UV 
for it to really be uh, effective as part of that, that multi-barrier. And that's all I had to say, so thank you very much. Questions for Mike? There's going to be a quiz on this later, so you got to ask some questions. Yeah, now. that was from a lecture, actually. <laughs> Oh, right. Well, it, we talk more about UV dose, which is intensity and contact time. So it, it, that would really depend on what intensity of light you are talking about. But, but, but typically, though, in, in UV systems, you're talking about fairly intense light and very short contact times, like on the order of seconds, really. Yeah. Yeah, so compared to something like chlorine, which you might need to hold for 30 minutes to 60 minutes, UV could contact time is just a few seconds, perhaps, as long as your UV source is has enough intensity, which most UV sources do. Yeah. If you're talking about solar, though, it might be. Yeah, most <laughs> germicidal UV. Solar is not seconds, that's more in the minutes, hours. Yeah. So to ensure that you have that contact time, you mean? Do you mean to ensure that you achieve that contact time? Yeah, it's, it's complicated actually, and, and UV systems are designed so that with using models of fluid dynamics, for example, to make sure that the water gets a sufficient contact time as it passes through the reactor. Um, so if, if you're talking about seconds, uh, you know, short circuiting of water becomes more important because if there's a pathway which gets through in half a second instead of one second, that's going to have a, a big impact. Whereas in a chlorine contact tank, a difference in contact time on the order of half a second is not important, really. So, yet you do have to make sure that the reactor and the way that the flow through the reactor is designed it has been done carefully. Really good Does that answer? I think, we'll, I think we'll hear more about that today because, I mean, one of the advantages of UV is that you don't need to wait 30 minutes to drink water. It immediately is disinfecting. So it's a point of use, point of consumption technology. So I think it's a lot of advantages in that way. Um, it's very effective very quickly. So that, that was the point is that you don't need a lot for long contact time to achieve the dose. For instance, if you have a, a lamp that's emitting, um, you know, in the watt range, number of watts, you saw the 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 units here of mil milliwatts needed, so that's a thousand times less. So the output, you know, the output intensity is really important, but it usually needs a very very short time. And typically, we're overdosing with UV systems. And I think when you see some of the talks following up and the systems in place in the field, you'll get a better idea how UV is performing and, and some of the advantages of that that aspect of it. Typically, too, with UV systems, there are limits on the flow rate through the system that you should move. To, but so flow rate is fairly easy to measure. And that will have a relationship with the contact time. So you don't want to be you know, pushing the water too quickly or through, through a reactor that has a certain limit on the flow rate. So, yeah. No, I mean, quite often that is that is the approach, is that UV will maybe do some things for you, like disinfect cryptosporidium or things which are difficult to, to handle with other disinfectants, and then the other disinfectants will do other things for you, like oxidize iron or, or look after taste and odor. So it's, it's, commonly, it's common that you see UV as part of a multiple barrier strategy with different treatment technologies in place alongside. I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> they, bo they both have pros and cons. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
UV causes a, a number of different things to happen um, biologically, but really the impact on nucleic acids that I showed is, is the main one that inactivates the organism. And the term inactivation is, is really more appropriate than killing because uh, um, in theory the organism could, there are mechanisms whereby an organism could repair itself, but the finding is that at the doses that are typically used in UV disinfection, you, you don't get that repair occurring because of the degree of damage you cause to the organism. But it's mainly the damage to the nucleic acid Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike.